Millions of adults in the U.S. are diagnosed with vascular disease, and it's no wonder. With over 60,000 miles of intricate arteries and veins throughout the human body, there are bound to be complications due to blockages, weakening of the blood vessel wall, and other issues impacting the circulatory system. With an aging population and the growing incidence of risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking, and the disproportionate incidence of vascular disease in our minority populations, the management of vascular health is becoming a key focus among today's healthcare leaders and providers. As with any medical disease or condition, it takes an entire team of dedicated professionals to find new ways to efficiently diagnose and treat patients, as well as to improve their long-term care. In vascular health, the leader of the team is today's vascular surgeon. Only vascular surgeons dedicate their entire training and practice to address the full spectrum of vascular health, as well as provide comprehensive care that includes preventive, medical, surgical, and minimally invasive solutions. Through ongoing education and research, as well as pioneering new techniques, vascular surgeons are on the leading edge of clinical breakthroughs that are transforming vascular health. As part of their comprehensive approach, vascular surgeons partner with other healthcare professionals to provide quality care tailored to each patient. This patient-centered model is vital to help all physicians manage vascular health in at-risk populations and promote healthier lifestyles in the future. Vascular surgeons are involved in every part of the disease process. From making the diagnosis to the management of disease, Vascular surgeons are comprehensive leaders in vascular health. Today's vascular surgeons are creating a new chapter in the vascular health story with improved patient care, better outcomes, collaboration, and leadership. Surgery is only part of our story.
Welcome to our live webcast, really cool initiatives from the SVS Health Information Technology Task Force. Thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the chat, Q&A, and polling window. Please note, if you don't see the chat, Q&A, or polling windows, make sure that you're not in full screen mode. In the Q&A area, there's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the top where you'll type in your questions for the panelists. To send a question, click on the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. The chat feature is for audience discussion only, so if you want your questions answered by the panelists, please submit them to the Q&A tab. You will also have the ability to upvote submitted questions by hitting the thumbs up like button next to the approved questions. We're joined today by Dr. Kim Hodgson, immediate past president of the SVS. At this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Hodgson for opening remarks and panelist introductions. Dr. Hodgson, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another in the SVS Town Hall series, tonight devoted to some really cool initiatives from the SVS Health IT Task Force, a new task force constituted just about a year ago at the SVS. I'm joined today by my co-moderator, Dr. Judith Lynn, Professor and Chief of Vascular Surgery at Michigan State University. Judith is the current and inaugural chair of the SVS Health IT Task Force and has been doing just a bang up job there. You've got some really exciting stuff to share with you uh, today. So we've got a real powerhouse panel of experts uh, today on the program. Oliver Alami is the Clinical Associate Professor of Surgery, the Director of Biodesign for Digital Health at Stanford University. Danny Burgess is Associate Professor of Surgery and Medicine at the University of Vermont. Thomas Carruthers is an Assistant Professor of Surgery at the Brown University. Misty Humphreys will be joining us, Associate Professor of Surgery at University of California, Davis. Shiv Nickham is the CEO of Mundi.com. You'll be hearing more about that in a little bit and also a vascular surgeon in the Geisinger Health System. And last but not least, then Peter Rossi, uh, who's the chief of the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery and associate professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So at this point, it's with great pleasure that I turn the, uh, the podium over, if you want, to our, my co-moderator, Dr. Judith Lynn, who's going to give you a little bit of an introduction to tonight's program and give you some insight into why we've selected this panel of experts. So I'll stop my share now and uh, turn it over to you, Judith. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Hodgson. First, uh, welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I'd like to welcome first our viewers to the current SVS Town Hall. Today, I have the distinct honor to co-moderate this session with Dr. Kim Hodgson, who is the immediate past president of the Society for Vassal Surgery and the David S. Sumner Professor and Chairman Emeritus of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at Southern Illinois University. So uh, here are our disclosures. We are joined today by six additional panelists. Dr. Oliver Alami, who you know is from uh, Stanford University. Dr. Alami is the founder and developer of the SVS Branded Supervised Exercise app and who will discuss the onboarding process for the SVS Supervised their exercise therapy app in vascular health. Dr. Peter Rossi is a chair and a, uh, associate professor, and he will discuss comparison with the traditional supervised exercise therapy. And in addition, we will poll the audience and discuss amongst the panelists on how we can improve the process for the SVS supervised exercise therapy app. So our next section is will be the two panelists who will discuss the current status of the vascular quality initiative and their integration with the electronic medical records. Dr. Danny Burgess is from the University of Vermont. He will give us an update with uh, Dr. Nick Carruthers, who is from Brown University, who will present the streamlining VQI data entry into EMR. We will also then poll the audience and discuss among the panelists on the need for the VQI integration and EMR and clinical informatics. Our last section will be focused on telemedicine legislature update by Dr. Misty Humphrey from the University of California, Davis, and Dr. Shiv Nickham 
of Geisinger, who will give us a hands-on experience and presentation on the use of HIPAA compliant app that allows for interoperability and portability of patient-centered care into both asynchronous and synchronous models. So the brief overview of the SVS Health Information Task Force is our job is to analyze digital health, virtual care, clinical informatics, and augmented intelligence in vascular surgery. As you know, the current problem includes administrative burdens, physician burnout, persistent health inequality, patient disengagement, and unsustainable rising costs in healthcare. The goals of the task force is really to reduce the administrative burden to engage the, our patients and support the vascular surgeons to reduce some costs as well as promote equity. So the topic is focused for tonight is into three different areas. First, we'll be talking about the um, current launch of the SVS STT app, which is the goal is to increase patient engagement and wellness using the remote monitoring and coaching system. Um, secondly, we will also discuss the VQI integration with the EMR, namely EPIC, um, and also going into Cerner as well. This will help pr promote physician wellness and decrease burnout and the burden of data entry and clerical work. And lastly, the telemedicine and the digital technology, we will explore using a HIPAA compliant virtual platform. And this is to enhance patient physician relationship and to improve uh, communication across various healthcare systems. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn over to Dr. Oliver Alami who will then um, present his introduction of the supervised exercise therapy. Perfect, hello everybody. Can, uh, can everybody hear me? Just wanna make sure. Can you hear me? Sounds yep. good. You can, okay, good. Sorry about that, just wanna make sure. So thanks for the, uh, thank you for the introduction. It's been a real honor to work with the uh, SVS and the SVS uh, Health IT Tech Committee uh, to work on this project. This is kind of a, career goal of mine, my research focuses heavily on uh, clinically validating the sensors in smartphones and smart watches. So it was kind of a perfect fit to take that, you know, all those learnings and um, bring them to uh, help benefit patients uh, through this SVS uh, exercise therapy program uh, launch. So as a disclosure, I am a co-founder of uh, the original project, which was called VASTRAC, which is being used um, on the iOS side for this program. And I'll get into that a little more. But you know, for those on the call um, that may have not heard of exercise therapy or don't use it, I'll just start with, you know, what is supervised exercise therapy? And currently there is, you know, there are, uh, or it is a gr uh, grade one um, uh, SVS guideline um, to recommend uh, this exercise therapy for patients with intermittent uh, claudication. Um, the problem is that we just don't uh, have the programs and it's very challenging for patients. But what is it? It's basically a hospital-based program in a gym-like setting uh, that should be usually linked to a clinic uh, or a hospital. And it com is comprised of 36 sessions over 12 weeks where patients are expected to come in. They're usually put on a treadmill if they can tolerate it. Uh, it's set to a certain speed run by exercise physiologists. And... Um, they are then pushed to uh, exercise on the treadmill until they develop symptoms and stop. And this is, and they go through this for about 30 to 60 minutes, uh, three times a week for 12 weeks. It's actually incredibly uh, beneficial. There's an, a, a lot of data, um, old and new. This is some fairly recent data uh, from the Netherlands where they have very, very um, high uh, compliance of this program in patients with claudication. And it's pretty remarkable when they look at their data, they can actually prevent interventions uh, over uh, a one year period and up to 90% of patients in over two years in the set group, they could prevent uh, or avoid interventions in up to 82% of patients versus in patients who chose surgery first, you can see at two years, um, only 65% of patients uh, had freedom from uh, intervention or reintervention. So there's uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, data. And just earlier this month in Nature Medicine from activity data, 
that was just really seven days of rock accelerometer data in uh, 94,000 uh, patients. Uh, this is using the UK Biobank uh, data. Uh, when patients were followed for three years, uh, there was a very high um, mortality benefit, obviously, in, in these patients that exercise. So, you know, there are clearly cardiovascular benefits uh, for this sort of uh, intervention. And, uh, you know, when we talk about co providing comprehensive care, it makes a lot of sense for uh, the SVS and vascular surgeons to get behind this. But as I mentioned before, the utilization is quite poor. In our survey, a national survey that we uh, ran uh, last year, you know, when we surveyed uh, physicians, whether they've referred patients to a program, about 50% of vascular uh, surgeons referred patients to a program. But if you ask if they would like to refer uh, patients to a program, up to 97 or 98% almost uh, would say they would like to refer. So the problem is, you know, lack of um, available programs. We don't even have one in uh, where we are. And uh, in addition, uh, there's very uh, poor compliance with patients or high drop-off rate. So, you know, uh, under Dr. Hodgson's leadership, um, there was uh, an initiative to see if we could do this, if we could provide something like this remotely. And that's where the Society of Vascular Surgery uh, SVS set program um, came to life. And it's, you know, this isn't the first rodeo or the first time this has been attempted. There've been many, many prior home-based therapy programs. Um, uh, Mary McDermott, for example, has run multiple programs, but this is the first of its kind in terms of the, the, the level of coaching that's involved and the level of uh, potential uh, techno technological innovation in terms of tracking activity, seeing if patients are being compliant with the exercise programs and not. So that part is quite unique and we're really excited. This was announced at VAM in uh, 2020 or earlier uh, this year. So the unique, so the components, you know, I came into this very much as a, as a tech, uh, technological person thinking the technology would solve all the problems. But as I interviewed more and more patients and learned more about the disease and especially interviewed pa patients around the country with the um, help of vascular cures, the, uh, it became very clear that patient education was a huge missing component uh, or something that patients were lacking in a, in a major way. And by that, I mean just simple knowledge about, you know, what PAD is, um, why, you know, is the pain okay if they walk up to a point of pain? Um, and I feel like these, you know, the education is huge, especially when you're trying to promote behavior change. Um, something else the program does, which is unique and hasn't been done before, is that we can, you know, measure the uh, performance of patients at the beginning and the middle of the, and the end by uh, performing a, a home-based six-minute walk test. Uh, which is fairly unique. So that's a an objective way to uh, to measure the performance uh, from the beginning or throughout the program. We also um, ask them about their you know other health status questions. We measure uh, their quality of life through some validated um, uh, uh, patient reported outcome uh, surveys, such as the vascular qual six, some general quality of life questions using the Euroqual five. We also are looking a lot at passive activity data. It turns out in the current research that passive activity um, is actually very indicative of, um, of their functional uh, capacity if you're able to track it every day. The, um, we then, with the help of the health coaches, set program goals um, in terms of what they want to do. Some just want to be able to walk down to the park. Others want to be able to walk and be with their grandkids. Others have more lofty goals of, you know, greater exercise uh, goals. So we really designed the program with the help of the coaches to the patient's um, desires and needs and try not to set un um, the goals that are uh, unobtainable. And another really unique part of this program is that uh, these exercises can be scheduled. So there will be a schedule uh, for these exercises and we can track whether you know, they've performed the exercises, are they being compliant, are they meeting the minimum requirements for exercises per week, are they overperforming, underperforming, and these are things that are all available for the coaches and the providers to see if they want uh, to help provide constructive feedback and figure out what the barriers are uh, for the participants. 
The, uh, at a very high level, this is a ver uh, very much a physician prescribed program. So it's not consumer facing, meaning, you know, we're not uh, making this openly available for patients to find on, on, you know, in the app store or just to sign up independently. Uh, we do, uh, it is physician driven, meaning, you know, you as the provider uh, would see a patient that would meet the criteria for, uh, you know, for this to be recommended. And then you would give them the uh, information and um, sign them up for the program. The um, and once so that's on the far left. You can see that you know the diagnosis is made. They then sign up for the program. We then go through the, uh, the assessments, both physical assessments, uh, health uh, assessments. Uh, we set their goals with the help of the coaches, and then uh, they're on their path to uh, to perform the exercise. Go through the 12-week program. And throughout the program, the coaches, the live coaches, have an opportunity uh, to look at a dashboard and get kind of live uh, updates on how the patients are doing, how compliant they are. The physician offices as well have the opportunity, although are not required, to engage at any point. And really, the patients can just follow up the way they normally would um, uh, follow up. And so no active engagement is required um, after the initial um, onboarding or um, prescription of the program by the provider. If I, had to, if, to, if I had to break it down a little more detail, something we learned is that it is helpful to have kind of this week zero concept. So we do, we do have patients for the first week go through the onboarding with the help of the coaches, go through some of the, they're not very long, you know, six questions for one survey, five questions for another survey. Um, and uh, we kind of, see how engaged they are, how interested they are in the program. And based on that, we have the opportunity to either have them continue, you know, and the coaches try to address whatever, whatever barriers they may be facing. And if it looks like the barriers are things that cannot be uh, resolved, then they most likely um, would not continue with the program because we want to, we want to design for, for success. And if they do um, meet the criteria and they can, they're engaged, they're interested, and they're able to onboard with the help of the coaches uh, that can even call them, um, then uh, they're started on their uh, daily walk uh, program. And uh, around every walk, they uh, we do ask some questions about where they're walking. Uh, also at the end, whether they had to stop, if they experienced pain, to what level, to try to really get some patient reported uh, objective uh, data around their performance throughout the program. And what's really unique about this is that the um, every day they're going to get, you know, when they open the application to do start their walk, they'll get a one or two sentence little daily dose of education. So that's one way uh, the education is absorbed through these daily doses. And, and, and we address the, you know, the smoking cessation, dietary measures, what is PAD, um, uh, you know, how does, how does exercise help, all those things throughout the entire uh, program. And then in addition, there are three uh, very extensive certificate level courses, uh, which each take about 20 minutes uh, that you can start and stop as you want um, on uh, what is PAD um, nutrition and also uh, exercise therapy. And, um, you know, ideally, we'd love for the patients to go through that program. Traditionally, uh, in in-person programs, um, you know, those, these are the, we try to include all the educational components that would be normally provided in those in-person programs. Um, the assess, objective assessments, including the six-minute walk test, the um, PROs, uh, such as the VASCA qual Euroqual questionnaires, um, happen at week zero, week six, and week 12, um, so we can have some objective tracking of how they're doing. And, uh, and the weekly, and the coach uh, checks in with them once a week. Um, and that can be through text message, calling, and the patients have a chance to engage the coach whenever they want. The, um, just at a very high level, this is kind of what it looks like. It's very much uh, cell phone, cell phone number-based. This is also designed to work on a feature phone. So even if you don't have a smartphone, you just have a feature phone, you don't get all the fancy bells and whistles in terms of metrics of, you know, the accelerometer data collection. 
but we do uh, can, we can see if you're starting a walk uh, and basically track the time that you're walking. Um, and that's something that the patients um, let us know by starting and stopping the walks. So, you know, you can see here, um, you know, you start up with your cell phone, you have to confirm your number through a, once you get a confirmation code. And what's really unique about the CellEd platform, which is the partner uh, tech firm that's building this, is that it's very audio and text-based, meaning you will get every message is, it comes with an audio uh, with it, and it's all done by voice actors. And so it's quite, quite engaging. Uh, and they have, you know, background noises and all this stuff. So it sounds, uh, it's, it's a really engaging way um, uh, to learn. Um, obviously, you have your, you know, privacy policy, terms of service. And then uh, you can see that if you have a smartphone, you'll have some buttons to push. You, if you want, you can put in text uh, for some scenarios, uh, things like that. And um, this is also, I don't have the UI for the actual walk, but you'll see a little clock going counting. For a six minute walk test, it counts down and for the, the daily walk, it counts up. The, um, I mentioned the coaching, this is a huge, huge, huge component of the program. And if you talk to Mary McDermott, you know, that was one of the big, big areas she would, um, or she recommended to kind of focus on is to provide more consistent coaching um, to help with behavior change and education and uh, kind of motivation for these patients. So we have certified health coaches that are part of the program that will engage the patients on a weekly basis, help with tech support, you know, onboarding, all those things to make it really lightweight uh, or as lightweight as possible for the uh, programs that are involved or the sites that are involved. There are obviously some automated nudging um, that the coaches send out as well just to keep engaging the users as much as possible. There, um, it's hard to see this dashboard, but you can get incredible granular information from the dashboard, including, you know, how many, when the last time they were connected to the system, how many minutes of educational content they've gone through, how many courses they've completed, every daily step count if you want, uh, which is hard, you know, often hard to interpret. You also, more importantly, get to see the coaching notes. The coach will maintain kind of notes and you as, uh, have that opportunity to go to the dashboard, see your patient panel um, for your site, and then get uh, review the uh, patient notes. And I'll tell you why that's important in a little bit. Um, there is a, a dashboard. This is my little mock-up. But basically, there is a one-page PDF that you'll be able to print out. And that PDF will give you all the summarized information. So you, when you review the data, um, is it's enough to look at this one page report it tells you how far along they are, where they started, you know, what the goals are, where, if they've met their goals, are they improving in terms of passive daily activity, exercise time every week, uh, in terms of exercise um, programs, you know, have they gone, um, have they uh, performed the, um, or performed enough walks uh, every day, and also you'll see the six minute walk test results as well as the uh, course completion. So I think that's really important to have a one page. And most people that we talked to said that having some sort of a PDF or, or that's download, downloadable is very helpful, especially when you consider billing and so on. And I'll get into that. Or if you want to, if you want to, if you want to incorporate the results into your electronic medical record, that'll be the way to do it. It'll be to download this PDF currently from the portal, and then you can upload the PDF into your media tab or whatever. Uh, way. So we selected some pilot sites in July 2020, and really there's no, um, we, we wanted there uh, for this initial pilot phase, we did want to make sure to cover, you know, broad uh, geographic regions, you know, that are hot, cold, rainy, dry, humid, to be able to figure out what, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And so we tried to get, uh, we have about 12 to 15 sites that we're working with currently um, to onboard and to start um, enrolling patients. So it's really important during this pilot phase to get as much information to figure out uh, how to be successful and to fix any problems. Um, that's really important at this phase. Um, in terms of uh, onboarding, we did uh, start you know, onboarding these sites after the selection. It's kind of, kind of an arduous process. Uh, because, you know, the platform is going to 
withhold some patient, uh, PHI or patient health information. So we have to be very cognizant and follow the HIPAA rules and guidelines and engage each site uh, fairly, um, you know, meet with the privacy officers, the CMIOs, sign a business associate agreement just to make sure everything is above board and that we're following the protocols. Um, so that's kind of the phase we're at at different, le different steps with the various programs currently. And it's also very important to talk about enrollment workflow. What does that look like for your program? And I'll get into that in a little bit. We have, you know, we have um, the opportunity for programs to have kind of a no-touch approach where they say, here are here's a list of 20 patients that we want to onboard. And then uh, the cell ed team would take that, uh, take the list, call the patients, engage them, get them onboarded, and take care of everything. Um, there's the low touch, which I think is most likely what programs will use, which is where, you know, you'll see a patient in the office, they, they're clodicans, they're patients you want to onboard, and then you uh, give them a PDF uh, flyer that we, that cell ed will generate for you with your site code. And then uh, the patients can uh, onboard themselves. And once, once they in the, do the initial downloading and um, put in their phone number, the coaches will reach out to help them get through the rest. And then, you know, if the sites want to take on more, you know, want to onboard the patients themselves fully, that's possible as well, but uh, less likely. So for the clinic, the sites that do sign on, we, you know, we have very, a nice set of toolkits, you know, which include um, information, playbooks, manuals on, uh, for resources for the clinics, on the program background, uh, as well as some patient flyers that are site specific that you can uh, hand out. So that'll, that's available for sites. We also have a, site, a resource for patients where they can go and uh, troubleshoot if they have any issues. So after that, the, the actual launch or first enrollment is planned for September, which is around the corner. The, um, and again, I wanna describe the pilot phase. The, the, this initial pilot, we wanna make sure to um, enroll, start enrolling patients by uh, September 21st. And uh, the goal is to, um, or I'm sorry, to enroll, yeah, uh, no later than October 12th, because we need to be done with this pilot by December 11th to be able to do our initial analysis to, to see how, um, how patients fared, where, you know, what were the issues, did they improve, did they not improve? So it's a very, that's why it's uh, fairly um, focused at this stage. The, um, in terms of reimbursement, there currently is no direct reimbursement for uh, such a, uh, a program, even for the in-person program, really wasn't fully funded by CMS. They do provide, um, you know, facility fees, but they don't provide physician fees. So what a lot of programs that we've talked to are doing different things, such as the most common scenario we've heard is that, you know, providers will uh, plan on a monthly video visit with the, the patients reviewing the data to discuss, you know, how it's going, is it going better or not? Uh, and you know what's working, what isn't working, and um, so that's the most common option where it's one way to get reimbursement through this. Another one which needs to be tested at each site is the are these new CPT codes to basically get reimbursed for reviewing patient-generated health data, and this is a fairly new thing that's um, you know just earlier this year, uh, late last year they they just updated the codes this year. And it's really trying to encourage remote uh, monitoring of patients uh, to basically uh, encourage more preventative care. Uh, so this fits right in with what uh, what our initiatives are. You know, in discussions with a lot of insurance companies that are you know very keen on keeping their their members healthy, uh, and those you know Medicare Advantage uh, systems or uh, systems that are both payers and providers. Uh, there's a lot of interest in rolling out such programs. And in, um, you know, we do plan, you know, if once we kind of fine tune things, uh, there is a plan to be, you know, an opportunity to be part of a randomized controlled trial starting in January of, uh, or December of this year, or January of next year. And uh, something I didn't really create a slide for, but we're also very excited about it as the, and, um, Dr. Burgess is going to talk about a little bit is the whole opportunity to collect PROs or patient reported outcomes. So we're really, we're 
looking into the concept of can this be used as well to simply uh, gather patient reported outcomes longitudinally uh, for patients. And so we're working um, as well with the VQI to see if that could be an um, opportunity to plug into the, the VQI registry. So that, that pretty much sums up my um, presentation. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this. I think it's, um, I think it really puts the SVS in a good position with, uh, you know, with all the referring physicians and really uh, kind of highlights the whole comprehensive care approach. You know, if, they, if you're a site that's interested, if you go to the SVS uh, Health Technology tab, uh, you will find a link to where you can sign up as an, a site that's interested because we are probably going to have a uh, rolling or, um, site uh, onboarding uh, for this. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give it back to Judith. Can you hear me, Judith? I think she's muted. Yes, go ahead. Yep, we're gonna go, we'll go ahead and move on. That was an awesome um, overview and presentation on the onboarding process of this important um, health initiative. And so we're gonna go ahead with Dr. Pete Rossi, who will um, discuss uh, the current available supervised exercise app. He's gonna share the screen. And in terms of managing patients uh, with claudications, and we'll have the question and answer session after his Perfect. Thank you. Judith, can you hear me okay there? Yes. Okay, I'm going to work on sharing my screen um, there. And do. We can see it. Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Got to get back to page one here. Okay, thanks, Judith. And uh, Thanks, Dr. Hodgson, for helping moderate this. It's an honor to be here talking about this tonight. This has been a, a really good group to work with. So, you know, as, as most of you are aware, the U.S. really is kind of behind the rest of the world to an extent uh, in terms of supervised exercise therapy. And Oliver had mentioned uh, the Netherlands having a fairly large network that really requires supervised exercise therapy before going through intervention for claudication. So on May 25th of 17, CMS uh, passed national coverage determination for peripheral arterial disease with supervised exercise therapy. And we'll go through the details of this in a little bit, but implementing this became a little bit of a challenge because even though there was a national coverage determination, it was still up to the local carriers uh, to allow these things to go forward. So it took a little bit to get these rolled out. Now that they've been rolled out, um, the way that these training sessions work is that patients had to be referred for supervised exercise therapy by a physician. These sessions are 30 to 60 minutes in length, as Oliver had mentioned before, and it's for patients who have symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. Now, I have a list of codes for that coming up here in a little bit. These uh, sessions are required to be performed in either a hospital outpatient setting or a physician's office and do require physician supervision in order to be reimbursed by Medicare. So for patients that are going through this in a, in a physician's office, if the physician is not present, those sessions cannot be uh, reimbursed. And supervision requirements are a little bit hazy. Um, essentially, you have to, there has to be a physician in the building or a PA or nurse practitioner who's certified in ACLS and BLS. And there are a number of protocols that have to be in place for each one of these facilities, essentially similar to the protocols that are used for intensive cardiac rehab. In order to put the referral in, there has to be a face-to-face -face visit documented with the physician that's responsible for the treatment and is referring the physician for that, or excuse me, referring the patient for that treatment. And along with that has to be documentation of education regarding risk factor reduction, including smoking cessation, which is really absolutely required for this. Um, and as all of us know here, it can be challenging by itself, but we all probably have programs in order to accommodate patients for this. And there also has to be either a statement in the medical record or a documented ICD-10 code uh, that shows that the patient is symptomatic with their PAD. And this is a list of those codes. Um, you know, I think I had all of the, uh, the four codes memorized back when we were on ICD-9, but with ICD-10, these are the codes that are currently allowable primarily for claudication 
which obviously is what this is all about. And it can be uh, claudication as a result of problems either with grafts or with native arteries, it doesn't matter. But one of these codes has to be documented somewhere in the medical record. So again, what's covered is up to 36 sessions over a 12 week period. Um, and this is where some of the challenge comes is actually getting patients to show up. Obviously people don't like going to these things and compliance for intensive cardiac rehab in several studies has been shown to be as low as 25%. And this is one of the challenges that we face with this and where the, uh, the app on the patient's mobile device may be very, very helpful to help improve compliance with this type of a program. You can get an additional 36 sessions covered over an extended period of time with approval from the, the local uh, uh, body. And it requ does require a second referral with a separate face-to-face -face visit. And the max maximum lifetime limit through CMS is uh, 72 sessions per patient. We actually rolled this out very early here uh, when this first came to fruition through Medicare. And fortunately at the time, we were in the process of building out our new inpatient and outpatient rehab units. So we combined this in our facility with cardiac rehab. So we actually have four sites in our system where we can provide these services. Two of them at our main hospital and one of our hospitals 26 miles north are uh, uh, physician supervised locations where there are physicians there all the time or APPs that are certified in ACLS. So those are open to all patients because the, uh, of the supervisory requirements. And then the two other facilities here, which are outpatient clinics, do not always have people on site that are certified. So we only offer those uh, services to non-Medicare patients. If a Medicare patient wants to go there, they have to sign an ABN, the Advanced Beneficiary Notification Form that says they understand that they may end up having to pay for that out of pocket. We've integrated this into our EPIC system for ordering so that basically if you type in PAD rehab or ambulatory PAD and pad, it comes up with the order set and comes through fairly easily and simply brings up this box. And in the box, what we've done for our referral system, you see under additional comments, um, essentially the chest pain management protocol is what's required for all these patients because if somebody starts to, to have chest pain while they're on the treadmill, you have to have all the protocols in place to treat them, which is part of why this has to be done in a, a facility with people that are certified. The way that this comes out, we actually run it through the same system uh, to incorporate the data that they use for intensive cardiac rehab. So this is an example of the intake for a patient that I referred back in January for outpatient PAD rehab. And they go through the entire system here in terms of the, the intake, what they talk to the patient about and the initiation of the Gardner-Skinner protocol, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly here in just a little while. But this is the protocol that we use that's essentially two miles an hour on a treadmill at a 0% grade. Um, if you think about that, it's actually really, really hard to walk that slowly on a treadmill for most of us. This is, uh, this is not a very high uh, uh, intensity exercise to start out. Um, but this is a patient who only tolerated this really for a few minutes to start out at the beginning of the, uh, at the program. And as he went on, uh, he was able to actually to uh, move up his exercise tolerance. And unfortunately, with this having started in, in January, he missed a few months because of COVID, uh, because all the rehab was shut down, but went back in July and has actually had a lot of progress, both working at home and working with the, the therapist. He's, I just saw him in clinic a couple of weeks ago and he's been absolutely thrilled with this program. It's been a, a lifesaver for him with bilateral SFA claudication or bilateral SFA occlusion and short distance claudication. So you can see the total time that he exercised with his last set here was for 29 minutes and uh, still needs a little bit more work in terms of his overall tolerance. So, what we've done here is co-located our PAD rehab with our intensive cardiac rehab programs in the hospital and in the outpatient clinics just with the uh, regular cardiac rehab programs. We do have a, a physical therapist and exercise physiologist that see the patient to do the initial consultation and initial intake. And these sessions have to be covered by physician supervision. So they send all their notes back to us through EPIC for signature so that we cover that supervisory requirement. Again, we opened a lot of this just before COVID-19 really started. We were getting things ramped up, so we sort of got um, slammed down there for a little while. But when we put these referrals in, they're really entered agnostic of the site. We don't specify the site for the patient to go to. We allow them to choose, and we let them know when we put the referral in 
that only the two hospital-based sites are approved for Medicare. So that if they're not going to be doing that, they're, we do give them quite a bit of a discount. I think they have to pay, I believe it's $50 for the initial session and the $10 per session after that is pretty cheap if they want to do that and pay cash out of pocket. There are some limitations to this, as we all know. You know, cardiac rehab compliance is notoriously poor, and this isn't much better. And, and like most of the people listening to the session tonight and participating, we all have referral practices. People are driving from a fair distance away, and they really don't like driving back and forth three times a week to do something like this. These patients chew up a lot of clinic time. If you're doing a lot of uh, chronic management, as we all are, that can take up a lot of time in your clinic if you're trying to see new patients. So we've actually moved, are moving this to an APP-based model where our, our PAs and our nurse practitioners in our clinic are running our claudication clinic. And the patients love that. They get a lot of individualized attention. They see the same people over and over, and it's really been a, a very nice program for them. We don't have a really good reporting system for our results. I showed you that intake form that we use and the, the sort of ongoing evaluations, but that's really in a PDF form. So that's not really researchable. We can search data, we can pull numbers by a search process, but you can't just pull that out to get data out of it and do research on it. Um, travel can be prohibitive and, and this is really a problem that is just begging for the solution that Oliver has been talking about for the, the last little bit here. I think this is really going to be a, a life-changing thing for some of these patients. And the patients that I've talked to about this app and clinic have been incredibly excited about it. You know, the people that are tech, te technologically savvy, people that are literate with their, their technology are really, really looking forward to this. So as the app is rolled out, uh, these are the sites that, are, that were on Oliver's map earlier. And we're trying to get 20 patients to hopefully enroll at each one of these sites. Um, I think a lot of people have already been talking to patients about it. People are very excited about it. And I, once the pilot is through and we get the initial set of uh, data analyzed, then the next thing would be to move on to the randomized controlled trial that Oliver had mentioned. Um, that's going to be looking at standard medical therapy and office-based management versus using the cell ed app. And I think uh, Judith is, is the PI who, uh, who's going to be bringing that forward. So it's a very exciting time. I think the technology for the, the app here has the potential to really change the way that we take care of patients with clonication. And um, I think you know, one of the challenges, obviously, that we can talk about later is, the, quite frankly, just getting people to buy into this idea as primary therapy versus all their physicians and everybody else trying to push them into quick fix interventions. So uh, I will stop there and turn this over to our next speaker and I thank everybody for their time. And yeah, that was great. Um, there we go. So we have a couple people that uh, have some questions. Um, we have time to answer them. Sure, Ronnie, can you put up our poll questions? Ronnie from Blue Sky, can you put up our poll questions, please? All right, let me read one to you. Um, so one question, Bob Patterson wrote in and wanted to know whether, uh, this might be for Oliver, whether you've done any focus groups with patients. Um, he said they've been working on something similar with the smartwatch. So these are the Q&A. We're talking about the text to screen questions that we would like to yeah. see. Yeah, so I mean, while um, the te text to screen is going up, I can answer that question. The, we absolutely did some focus group. Uh, so I work closely with Vascular Cures, which is an organization uh, here in the Bay Area that is very patient-centric, patient-focused. And uh, so we, uh, we talked to patients about this. Plus, I personally have done probably research. I last, over the last year and a half, maybe over 200 patients that we've actually given devices to. So they're t completely tech naive, most of them. We actually gave them a f iPhone, Apple Watch. So super, you know, high uh, tech um, or complex devices. And, you know, we're able to take a lot of uh, feedback. No system is perfect, uh, but something we uh, learned is, is, you know, is that the, uh, just obviously keeping things as simple as possible is important, uh, not asking too many questions, and the more support we provide, the, the higher the success rate. So that's why we're, we weighted the coaching so heavily. All right, um, let me go ahead and read the, uh, another text question from Taylor Ward, the medical student at the University of Washington. Nope, looks like we got it up right here. It's a middle question. I'll give it back to you, Judith. 
Yeah, people love mobile games. Um, yes, I agree, Taylor. Uh, health apps that emerge as the most successful universally strong have strong gamification elements. Have you considered implementing these elements, the like badges level achievements to increase compliance? Great question. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The ga game um, the gamification is, is a huge part of it. And there are many ways you can do this. Uh, and we've, you know, we've thought about it at this stage. We don't have any of those features implemented, but some ideas are to kind of, you know, when they, for example, perform the six minute walk test to kind of show where they, where they fall relative to, you know, everyone else anonymized. Uh, but definitely with the badges, you know, around the educational part, we did give them, you know, we did, we do give them, um, you know, certificates and badges for, uh, and try to make every time the coach checks in, the, the focus is, you know, how, where have they been successful? How have they been successful? But that's a great comment that I think we can do more with over time. Fantastic. And I think we went over the coverage as well. Um, um, yeah, one last uh, uh, quick question has come through. I'll send it over now uh, on this section and then we can move on to the next section. I'll let you field this to Great. whoever. When you work with patients, how much time is spent troubleshooting the app versus educating about blotication? PAD. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it, uh, that's a really, really good question. So the initial part is just getting them started. So when we onboard them, it's mainly going over the technology. And also uh, what we really try to get across is uh, how the pain, you know, how most people, when they experience pain, they, they want to stop. They think they're hurting themselves. So just educating them that, you know, based on the clinical evaluation that they have claudication and that walking is actually beneficial. And then we kind of coach them through what, you know, what that rep should look like in terms of walking to the point of pain, stopping, walking, stopping. And that's, that's kind of, um, you know, that educational part is kind of reinforced over time. So that is education part, educational part continues throughout the program. Well, that's fantastic. So that about wraps it up. So we're going to go on to our next topic on clinical informatics, which um, we which will be uh, presented by our next two speakers, Dr. Danny Burgess and Dr. Nick Carruthers. Uh, they will discuss streamlining VQI data entry from the EMR and the future of clinical informatics. So please share your screen. And go ahead and um, ask any questions on the side. We'll be answering them at the end of their talk. All right. Hi there. Uh, can you all see the screen? Great. So uh, as uh, introduced, I'm going to be talking about uh, streaming, streamlining VQI data entry uh, from the EMR and main, uh, mainly going to be talking about EPIC here. So uh, neither myself nor Danny have any conflicts to report. Uh, talking about VQI, you know, most of us, I'm sure everyone on this call has uh, some familiarity with VQI, but it's a a uh, very large program, part of the SBS that uh, is now encompasses 14 registries, uh, PAD, carotid disease, carotid, excuse me, carotid endarterectomy, carotid stenting, uh, uh, among others, uh, and uh, collects a ton of demographic, clinical, procedural, and outcomes data. It's been around for four or five years. And as of uh, a few days ago, there are almost 700 participating centers with more than 700,000 procedures captured and 326 publications uh, currently involves the US and Canada. And as, as big as those numbers are, it's getting bigger. So uh, in June, it was announced that the VQI is joining with the American College of Cardiology's NCBR registry. Uh, so these two uh, databases are going to become one and uh, become hopefully become that much more powerful. So as with any database, you need to, uh, in order to have data for good studies, you need to have, get that data into the database. And uh, uh, M2S is the company that handles data entry and storage. Uh, and they have a web interface. So uh, you have a process whereby you enter your cases by logging into their uh, interface uh, using your login and password and credentials that you may or may not remember. Uh, when you go to log in, 
uh, you enter your cases, uh, uh, you know, ideally at the time of the case, just so you can remember it, uh, everything that has happened. But you are likely duplicating a lot of information that's already been captured in your local EMR uh, and uh, leads to some uh, extra work. So one of my um, uh, interests is you know, automating things that, that can be automated. And uh, this seems like a prime opportunity for uh, uh, combining data that is already being entered for billing purposes or for documenting documentation purposes in your local EMR and transposing that into the VQI database with as few steps as possible with as little uh, human re-entering of data as possible. Uh, this could uh, certainly reduce entry errors. Um, the fewer times that you're entering the same data uh, means the fewer times you're going to have a typo, for instance. Uh, it can reduce provider fatigue and having to do the same thing or having to remember to go log into a separate uh, database in order to enter your cases. And can possibly increase compliance and decrease missing data. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm talking uh, for this particular talk, mainly talking about EPIC. Uh, uh, because that is the system that I am most familiar with, but uh, we'll touch on a few others at the end. So this idea, it's not a new idea. I'm not claiming credit for, for doing this. This has been around uh, uh, in various forms for a, a number of years. Uh, the VQI at, at VAM in 2017, uh, someone presented a, uh, a VQI specific EMR brief operative note. Uh, this was a poster presentation at VQI. In 2019, there were two of them, uh, one from a University of Pittsburgh operative note template project, and then one that was uh, a project that I worked on with Bob Patterson as well at uh, locally here at, at Lifespan and Brown University. And our project here was, a, as I kind of alluded to, it was a local effort. It was uh, uh, with a full project with the uh, support of the information technology group, uh, we had dedicated analysts, uh, we had a project manager, and we went through and uh, created VQI-specific opnote templates for uh, for peripheral arterial disease, and uh, I believe for carotid artery, uh, carotid endarterectomy as well. And this, just for our local instance, uh, was a pretty big lift. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, development time, a lot of uh, meetings to figure out what we were um, going to include or how we were going to include it and getting people on board, the different, uh, the different stakeholders, the vascular surgeons, the uh, cardiologists and the interventional radiologists. And we, we have had success with this, uh, but again, all the work that we put in uh, only applies to our local institution and, um, and not to others. So obviously we are not, uh, as I mentioned before, we were not the only ones thinking of this. Uh, Epic has, uh, as part of their system, they have a, the community library where uh, content that is created on the system is to some degree automatically shared uh, on, on what's called the community library. And as of a couple of days ago, you go to the community library and you search for VQI and got 854 of these smart phrases or, or smart lists, the, the things that they share. Uh, which uh, would, I could boil down to or attribute to 48 unique institutions. And the, the community library is a, a good place for sharing. You can, you can see these smart phrases uh, uh, individually. You can download them. You could theoretically uh, import them into your system, but it requires a significant amount of IT legwork. It's not well documented in terms of uh, specifically for VQI. Uh, it's unclear how many of these are, are tied to discrete data, which I'll touch on in a little bit, and does not include any reporting tools. So if you wanted to use these things, you would be uh, picking and choosing from things that are out there and adapting to your system. And uh, it's a lot of work with uh, you know, variable results. So I am part of the Vascular Surgery Specialty Steering Board, uh, which is an, uh, an epic uh, organization that we formed about three years ago. Um, it is led by an EPIC employee and, uh, and with about 10 of us from across the country, a mix of uh, academic centers and uh, more private practice. 
and uh, and there's an elective uh, chair uh, uh, member who uh, this this year currently is Bob Steppiger from uh, University of Massachusetts Medical Center, uh, who has done an enormous amount of uh, epic work on the, their uh, build both at UMass and when he was at, uh, I believe it was University of Chicago. Um, we, uh, we were chosen as this because we're already doing a decent amount of work, uh, a lot of it on BQI, and, uh, uh, and that has become a focus of our meetings. Uh, it is a volunteer organization. We're not paid by EPIC, uh, though uh, we we do get the user group meeting fees waived if we choose to go. I don't know if that counts as a disclosure or not. I've never used it, but um, we have monthly meetings and uh, and you know, the usual back and forth via email. So for the VQI uh, integration as uh, as it relates to Epic is you know we are trying to adapt the best content that has already been developed by members uh, of the board and others. Uh, so not necessarily trying to reinvent the wheel from the, from the ground up. Um, and the the big point of this, as far as Epic is concerned, is is uh, saving data as uh, or saving entries as discrete data. So discrete data in Epic, uh, the technical term is they call them smart data elements, where uh, in within a note, if you enter, say, the ABI or the brachial blood pressure in an ABI was 140. Uh, rather than just being saved in textual format within a note, that uh, value can be stored discreetly in a field in a database attached to that note or that encounter uh, related to the patient. And this uh, discrete data makes it uh, easier to extract on the back end when you're looking to create a report for uh, uh, to send on to VQI or to M2S. Um, ideally, with these these notes, these templated notes, you're going to pull data from existing sources uh, to prevent that uh, repetitive documentation. So uh, the anesthesia record. So if the if the uh, database wants the initial uh, heart rate or the maximum heart rate during the operation, uh, if that's already documented automatically as part of the anesthesia record, that could be pulled out. Uh, you know, patient demographics, uh, obviously patient uh, weight. Uh, uh, Drug, drugs administered could be pulled from the record. And uh, uh, Dr. Burgess at the end will talk a bit about uh, device scanning, but as the, the FDA's uh, good ID, global unique device identifier uh, starts coming online, that could be used as well where you, uh, you don't have to enter any of the device data. You just scan a barcode on your life stent uh, and it automatically puts in uh, a six millimeter by 60 uh, uh, centimeter, et cetera. Um, and uh, these, this data capture can capture procedural uh, data. So uh, at the time of the operation, and if you use the EPIC system for your ambulatory system as well, it can be used to capture the long-term follow-up information. Uh, so uh, taking away those those forms that you might have to fill out in your office uh, as uh, in the follow up. Um, and the whole uh, point of this, but not only to uh, uh, minimize pr provider entry fatigue, uh, is also to minimize the need for manual abstraction. At our institution, we have to pay an outside company uh, to do some a decent amount of the, the abstraction to get it into the database. So now, uh, best case, you have your data in the system in a uh, efficient and uh, non-redundant fashion. How do you get it out uh, and get it into uh, M2S and VQI? You know, best case scenario would be a, di a direct HL7 or FHIR connection to M2S for data upload. You would just click a button and it would uh, transfer it over. Uh, this is a little bit pie in the sky just because of uh, uh, data security reasons, uh, those BAAs that uh, uh, Dr. Lamy was talking about. Um, so uh, we're not holding our breath uh, to be able to do that. A more reasonable thing uh, would be to do a, a SQL, structured query language based extract uh, from, uh, from the uh, EPIC that could generate a, a CSV or a different type of structure file that, that uh, M2S could accept and uh, in a format that they they approve and understand. Um, the 
last and kind of least favorable option would be free text transfer of notes, uh, which uh, uh, in the absence of a very strict template uh, loses the advantage of, dis of discrete data. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So now uh, you know, in the future, say we, we've uh, at, and as part of this epic group, we've created the content, we've created the forms, we've created the reports. Um, how do you get it out into uh, all the constituent systems? And I like to describe epic as kind of a, a Lego set. You don't buy a pre-made EMR, you just buy a big bucket of Legos and every single uh, uh, system is built a different way and there's, they're not necessarily uh, uh, cross compatible. Um, Epic is uh, including some new tools called a, a turbocharger that makes these plug and play installations a little bit uh, more straightforward. Um, so uh, the, uh, as part of this work, we're putting it into the Epic foundation system which is the, um, the base system when new installations are, are, uh, are put in at uh, uh, new hospitals. So uh, ideally new hospitals would include these DQI tools and through that turbocharger technology, the, uh, the basically pa packaging of, uh, uh, of content, uh, it could be a more of a plug and play installation at existing institutions. Um, and you know we would uh, obviously want to keep uh, in current any forms current with VQI changes as uh, registries are added or or data points are are added or changed. So what are the challenges of this? There you know there are many. Um, there uh, as I said right at the beginning, this is talking mainly about Epic, and uh, you know, I certainly understand that Epic is not the only player in town. Uh, Cerner, uh, Athena Health, uh, uh, or some of the other big ones. So uh, a lot of this would have to be done in those systems as well. And even within one uh, EMR, so again, talking about Epic, there are multiple workflows uh, uh, within the EMR that can get to the same the same endpoint. And so as an example, in our, uh, in our healthcare system, uh, 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 angiograms done by vascular surgery in the operating room are done in the op time environment with op notes. Uh, and, uh, and eventually the cardiology, um, uh, Cupid is not installed yet, but Cupid eventually will be installed. And that's a different workflow with uh, you know, different, potentially different uh, ways of entering the data. Radiant is the radiology equivalent as well. Um, data security and, and HIPAA compliance, of course, with anything uh, electronic involving PHI is uh, always a concern. Uh, intellectual property is something that we've uh, been wrangling with a bit, uh, something I did not expect uh, going into it, but things like the Wi-Fi score uh, are uh, you know, intellectual property of uh, SBS, uh, and uh, those, that intellectual property has to be respected uh, as you uh, are working with it and using it in a different commercial product such as uh, as Epic or Cerner. Um, and of course, keeping all of these things current with uh, VQI changes. Um, there are efforts uh, at the VQI level to uh, create uh, templated notes that are uh, coordinate, somewhat coordinated with this uh, Epic group that we're uh, that I've been working on. There is participa participation from SVS, uh, thoracic surgery, neurosurgery, Vascunet, etc. Um, the advantage of this is that uh, if we are all using the same templates, the same VQI approved templates, um, even if you're not doing the discrete data where you are saving these little <laughs> data points into database fields. Um, if it is a uh, standardized form, even in just text format, you could parse that out uh, relatively easily without having to resort to things like natural language processing or AI or, or whatnot. Um, this is an ongoing effort, of course. This last slide, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Danny Burgess, who uh, has done some work with the barcoding the, the, uh, uh, that I alluded to earlier. Thanks, Nick. I, for one, I certainly greatly appreciate uh, all efforts to make our interactions with the uh, EMR easier. So uh, I'm going to speak to two things. The first one I have a prepared slide for, the second not. The first is about uh, getting the device 
uh, into the registry using technology. The second is to piggyback uh, off some of the comments that uh, Oliver made about patient reported outcomes. So first, uh, the device. Uh, I think we all acknowledge that's uh, one critical piece to have in the registry. It's uh, been entered in the, in the registry since 2016, but it remains a challenge. And you know, I, for one, certainly understand that you know, the amount of data that goes into these registries, in particular the PVI one, you know, can be uh, onerous, uh, and it takes uh, a lot of time on physicians' parts, and uh, many places have to hire additional FTEs for this uh, to really work. So uh, the VQI is working uh, to try to make this uh, easier and uh, also more accurate on, on the device capture side. So uh, this summer, I started to trial it at uh, UVM, and uh, so far it's working uh, well within the PVI registry you know, for myself uh, to uh, directly you know, use the barcode scanner that we have in the operating room to talk to uh, uh, the M2S platform uh, on the PVI registry. Uh, I'm sure at, uh, at many places, uh, hospitals are already using barcode scanners for, you know, for other purposes, for uh, inventory, billing, and, and so forth. And some of those even talk to the EMR. So this uh, uh, you know, leverages that, you know, dual, dual purpose is that, and uh, hopefully can save the time and some of the frustration that uh, people may feel trying to find the device uh, using the existing uh, mechanism. So uh, that's being uh, piloted, and uh, we hope to uh, spread that out uh, uh, more broadly uh, uh, as the uh, uh, as time goes as time goes on. Um, in, in terms of speaking, it, uh, putting that out more broadly, this is uh, going to even uh, more relevant uh, with the upcoming merger of uh, ACC and CDR PVI and uh, uh, the SVS VQI uh, PVI and carotid registries. Uh, Kim well knows he was an integral part of that. Uh, and uh, thanks also goes to folks like Jens Jorgensen, Ralph Brindis over at ACC. I'm sure there was a million reasons not to do it, but some very good ones to do it. So I'm happy that got uh, pushed through. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, as we develop these relations and collaborations with our cardiology, you know, colleagues, uh, you know, for years, they've sort of uh, been more at the forefront of these structured notes uh, for PCI. Some of it has to do simply because their workflow uh, and the procedure lends itself more towards that. Some of it's uh, due to this increased scrutiny uh, they've had in terms of PCI appropriateness and billing. Uh, but uh, I think there'll be some opportunities there to work towards a structured uh, a PBI uh, note. Um, uh, I'm sure the content, as Nick alluded to on one of his previous slides, the content is there. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, making it, uh, uh, I guess, harmonious, uh, acceptable uh, uh, to, to many surgeons, and then making it uh, scalable and easily available for implementation at the sites. That's something that hopefully, as uh, Nick and the group work through on the carotid side, uh, uh, as my understanding is the carotid was chosen first because of its uniformity and then uh, we'll build off of that and try to get a structured PVI note uh, into the fold uh, at some point. So um, if you have interest uh, you know, in using this barcode scanning uh, technology, certainly contact me or some of the other uh, VKI contacts, in particular, Carrie Basella uh, has been a driving force behind this. So, uh, but I think it has great potential. Uh, I don't have a, a slide on patient reported outcomes, but I like the opportunity to expand on that a bit. Um, uh, the VQI is uh, heavily invested in this now, and it's been gaining critical mass to the point uh, that it looks like uh, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, gather this data from our patients in, in the coming years. Now, we certainly already get patient reported outcomes. Uh, uh, it's uh, you know, as a clinician, it's very rewarding to do a procedure and have the patient come back a few weeks later and be happy with their walking or start to have a healing wound. Uh, but I think it would be nice uh, uh, to make this more broadly available. Uh, and it would be, you know, great if we could have uh, these, some objective information on all our patients uh, after the procedure and at one year uh, to truly see uh, if our assumptions about uh, their satisfaction uh, are really uh, are met. Um, so this is going to be uh, rolled out in a pilot phase. It's not quite as mature as uh, Oliver's uh, SVS set uh, pilot, but it's uh, it's in uh, development. Uh, some of you may have seen the email that was requesting 
uh, you know, sites to join. We're currently kind of vetting those and going through them to try to get a, a diverse group of places uh, with regard to geography and academic versus community centers. And we anticipate approximately 10 centers that will pilot this at least for the first few months before uh, uh, getting towards a, you know, a VQI, a VQI uh, wide rollout. Uh, the pilot is called My PAD. Um, and uh, the reason why I think it fits into this committee and this webinar is I think the only way to make that work is to use uh, technology. Because uh, it's certainly a lot of effort to get the patient reported uh, outcomes uh, into the registry. Uh, so to the extent that we can make this uh, a direct to patient uh, interaction and not uh, uh, belabor uh, uh, already busy centers and, and clinics, I think that's the only way uh, it will be successful. So we're certainly sensitive to that and we're trying to find uh, uh, as many ways as possible to make that seamless and as less work as possible. And uh, beyond that, to make whatever work that uh, physicians, uh, data managers and centers put into it uh, to make it of value to them uh, by getting the feedback you know, back to the physician later about what their particular patient uh, reported outcomes were, uh, both on the individual and aggregate level. So um, uh, I've been you know, privileged to be a part of that process and I look forward to continuing that uh, uh, both within the VQI and to see how that can syner uh, synergize uh, with the SVS uh, set and uh, uh, sell that efforts. Thank you. Well, great. That was a fantastic um, overview and the current technology um, by Dr. Burgess and Dr. Carruthers. So with so much um, physician burnout due to charting and paperwork, now these important initiatives will help us offload some of that onerous uh, charting. So I, I don't see any question and answering. So I wanted to ask the uh, panelists, um, what do you think of some of, our, some of the current challenges for better integration of this EMR? You know, do you think the barriers of this integration is uh, resides on the physician? Is it the patient, government, or industry? Or and how can we sort of minimize these endless charting process for the physicians? Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it is technological, or not technological, but just the the wide array of uh, of different EMRs. I mean, there's been a lot of focus uh, recently on interoperability of EMRs, so that uh, uh, you know, your your local system can talk to the you know differently owned uh, system across the street. Uh, hopefully, as part of those things, we could maybe come up with some better uh, ways to to enter this data and uh, and get it over to the right place. But I, I'd say that that's the biggest challenge and we're, we're trying to address it from the epic side which is a, a big chunk of the market so that uh, at least we can hit uh, you know however many percentage epic controls right now um, and then Cerner as well Cerner would get a lot a lot of those and with uh, with the VA going to Cerner uh, that may or may not have an impact on on that uh, uh, and uh, uh, trying to get the, the VA involved, but I you know I can't speak for them officially. But um, that's so. Uh, let me t try to tackle that, Judith. Uh, you know, you, there's this uh, statement that you know, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Um, and I think that applies. We've been heard that applied to whether that's kind of economics or you know. I think it it it, it rings true. You know, here that. Uh, I don't want to be too sour about it, but we know that the you know, EMR is a billing instrument uh, in, in many ways. Uh, but I'm, hope, I'm hopeful, I guess, that quickly with you know, people with uh, Nick advocating for us, that uh, they would hope that the EMR vendors would you know, respond to the almost universal you know, physician uh, feedback that, or there's, it's, it, that is a dissatisfier. And to the extent that we can push some of these things forward, uh, it would be, uh, anyway, that would be that will be great, um, hopefully, uh, uh, in the future. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just, Dr. Humphreys, you have okay. a question? Okay, oh. Lisa, you go first. Well, Dr. Humphreys. Nick, I had a, for Nick and for Daniel, uh, how much of this is industry and the proprietary nature of these um, different products and how they don't want to necessarily communicate or they want to be able to charge for building all of these different things? how do we come together? Does the SVS come together and really push them? But I feel that this is a big part of this is industry and I, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, you know, all the work that we've been doing with Epic is specific to Epic. Um, I, I don't know that I have a good answer. Um, uh, <laughs> I, w I wish I did um, on on how to move that along. Other than you know the you know the the ideal would be all the EMR is the same, but uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, the you know going back to the VQI, excuse me, the the VA, the the uh, CPRS is kind of the best example of a national inter interop interoperable system, and it, it's going away for for Cerna eventually. But um, it, the there are government pushes for this interoperability, uh, so like talking between the systems, uh, so that there there will be requirements if if they're not there already. Uh, for the, to to share data, but even then, it's it's hard to uh, standardize that into uh, how things go into the system locally. Um, but but the, there are I local can, issues and national issues, right? So you know, locally, we just went through an epic upgrade not that long ago that that took us from two clicks to find an operative note to nine clicks, and <laughs> the response <laughs> the response of our epic team was, well, you'll get used to it. <laughs> and that's not okay, right? So I've been chasing that down, but we all need to chase that down. I think we as, as physician leaders need to be able to, to track that down in our own institutions and make that into a national issue. We, we can't be slaves to the EMR. It, the, the EMR is supposed to work for us and for the patient. Lo locally, the you know the solution to that is is uh, get involved with your IT right. uh, systems, yes. and you know there's only so many hours in the day, yeah. obviously, but but uh, you or your partners or, or someone from surgery or vascular surgery should be involved in the in, and be an advocate. Uh, yeah. And so I'm going to be a realist here. I I think it's never going to happen unless we walk out. And say we're not going to enter, do that next click. It's just never going to happen. We're not going to do that. So we have to work within the system that's in front of us. But if we could just get a few successes, you know, if this carotid project that you know Nick is championing can work, and uh, and we can pick off Epic and then Cerner, and uh, hopefully that will create a virtuous you know cycle. If we could at least get that far, um, where our where the data is being put into VQI, I think VQI members would, would be quite satisfied, you know, with that and, and the rest of the so, stuff I'm afraid we're gonna have to live with. <laughs> I have a, I have a comment from the digital health side, you know, the 21st century cures act, which Trump was supposed to announce uh, during the HIMSS conference, which is the healthcare informatics conference earlier this spring, uh, which was canceled. Mm -hmm. It did actually pass. And it, it was uh, really, it's billed as the information blocking um, update. And there's some strict language in there about um, preventing or, or opening up the data streams. And interestingly, CMS's take was to let the patient be the steward of the data. So they actually, by January of next year, in theory, through APIs, every electronic healthcare system that wants reimbursement for Medicare, um, is supposed to uh, provide an API that really that literally exposes all data elements of the EHR, which is it. incredible. Whether that's so going to happen or not, January of next year. But because of COVID, things are going to be delayed. And you know, uh, but this is this is really the pressure that they're putting on. So in, a, in the digital health space, you know, that the innovation isn't going to come from within the health record. It's going to be the layers on top the, through the exposed APIs, whatever products you build on top of that, on, of the record. And, you know, the patient, you're going to need the patients, which is a kind of a different um, approach. But if you can get the patient's approval to pull the elements that you need, you know, right now they only are supposed to expose 13 elements, you know, your, your um, allergies, you know, conditions, uh, things like that, you know, lab values, things like that. But I think looking in the future, at least that's where the government is putting the pressure or how they're putting the pressure on. They've realized they're not going to win, you know, the battle with directly with the, the EHR vendors themselves. But they can kind of force them to open up uh, the data and let the patients be the stewards. Just whether it's going to happen or not, you know, I don't know if you remember when when Judith Faulkner from Epic uh, literally wrote, uh, you know, she was trying to block this and get a lot of the HCA um, 
to you know get behind her to block this. It was a big deal, but it passed. So it's something you know some form of this is gonna uh, is gonna uh, take shape in the future. And un unfortunately, okay. the e even if it does the or when it I should say when it does the uh, the sharing at that level at the you know, application level yeah. API level yeah. doesn't solve the problem of the data entry at the local site. You know you're still gonna have your one person does it in pencil, and then the other person's doing it in pen. The other person's typing it. it it's uh, it'll just help with sharing it, which would potentially help getting it to PQI. But um, so it's so uh, Nick. I think that's what is interesting. I'll I refer to this a little bit later. The solution will come from patient side. Regulators, payers will require portability, interoperability, intercommunication. And ultimately, outcomes will depend upon doing the right thing. So I'll, I'll allude to that in my presentation. But we don't think it will come from uh, corporations that have created gag clauses on each hospital, saying you cannot share the data. So all these EMRs that we talk about hold hospitals uh, hostage to a gag clause that they cannot share it. The mandatory requirement to open up APIs where the patient can extract the data can be used effectively if we put patient at the center of everything. Uh, and I will refer to that during my presentation. Uh, but yeah, definitely we'll that's talk a later. great, great discussion. Now, you know, the problem of having a silo in our own uh, institution in the healthcare system is a major problem. So this is a great transition. So I'm going to, uh, without further ado, move on to the next section, which will be on patient-centered care on telemedicine. And um, Dr. Uh, Misty Humphreys will uh, present her discussion on telemedicine legislation update and future research needs. Go ahead. The unmute is always the challenge. So sorry about that. All right. So we're all very well aware of the CARES Act that came through and made some major telemedicine changes. It removed the CMS geographic location for telemedicine. It allowed the home to become an originating site for patients. It allowed for FQHCs and rural health clinics to become originating sites. And it mandated payment for audio only telephone communications as well as required pay to payer parity for telemedicine visits and expanded who could provide telemedicine services. It also allowed for providers that are um, offering telemedicine to charge for the originating site fee when patients were at home. And a lot of people have looked at many of these changes and thought some of them need to stay and perhaps some of them need to go. When you look at the number of seniors in Medicare that began using telehealth once it was approved by the CARES Act, it shot up dramatically. Only 11,000 senior or CMS beneficiaries were using it in, before the CARES Act, and it increased to approximately uh, 1.3 million in April of 2018, or sorry, April 18th of 2020. In addition, if we look at what our own clinics look like, the amount of telemedicine that we, visits that we do all increased. These, I think, are highly underestimated because for some of us, we transitioned to 100% telemedicine, for some of the other specialties, we transitioned to somewhere between 16 and 18%. And for the next couple of minutes, I want you to think of telemedicine a little bit differently. I realize that none of us want to sit in front of a screen and provide our care in that way. But can we rethink about what telemedicine means and use it in certain ways? And that is the concept of vascular deserts. So many of us are familiar with food deserts places where there are not healthy options for patients to get food. There are also vascular deserts, and I'm going to use uh, California as the backdrop of this, but this can apply anywhere, any place where you provide rural care. And so what we did is we looked at all of the vascular surgeons that were listed throughout the central California area. This does not apply to the Bay Area technically. So I excluded every, every provider in that area. But we looked at where there are vascular surgeons that are practicing in the Central Valley of California and up into Northern and Southern California, again, along that central corridor. And by this is already outdated because one of the providers has already retired. 
And what we found were there were huge areas where there are not vascular surgeons that are providing vascular care. We overlaid that with where we currently have telemedicine clinics so that we could potentially provide some of that information. And we saw that we have more telemedicine clinics in places that don't have a vascular surgery provider. And then we decided to add in two additional telemedicine clinics when it came to providing vascular care. Then we looked at where there are already FQHCs, which are now approved to act as both originating as act as originating sites, and we partnered with those. And when you put all of these together and you look at all of these maps, you see that there are FQHCs, and there are we personally have telemedicine clinics in some places where there are no vascular providers. And can we capitalize on that? All almost everyone is doing some type of outreach be it if you're in Wisconsin or if you're in Michigan, a lot of places already have outreach clinics. Can you adjust those in some ways to provide care in these vascular deserts where patients may not be getting the highest quality of care? And it is the answer to leverage some of that telemedicine. Right now, there are many changes that are planned for telemedicine in the, um, uh, in the CMS uh, update. Category one changes are changes that are gonna be permanent, meaning they will go beyond the public health emergency, which is what PHE means. But there are many things that they're going to make as only, um, only as long as there is a public health emergency in place would they be in effect, and those are category three, and they're listed here. So visit complexity and potentially doing care planning for cognitive patients, those would stay and be permanent but actually being able to do home visits where the patient is at home to get their telemedicine care is considered temporary. So that when patients, or when the public health emergency um, is, is over, they would no longer be able to get telemedicine services in their home. And we have to pay attention to this, and we actually have to start speaking up to CMS in order to make telemedicine visits from the home be permanent. There are so many different legislative bills that are being introduced right now from both sides of the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats, all looking at what telehealth should look like or telemedicine should look like for patients. And there are concerns on both sides. I participate in the Center for Connected Health policy, and we have legislative calls once a month where we talk to um, staffers from some of these um, some of these uh, legislators, and we hear what are the different concerns. And some of the concerns relate specifically to the idea of value. Value is something that we talk about a lot. It's quality over costs. What value may be is outcomes or patient experiences over direct and indirect costs. Is a patient's experience a great outcome? I think we're seeing more and more that the patient and patient reported outcomes are specific outcomes that we haven't looked at, but are highly important. So what does value in telemedicine look like? The concerns for quality is there is a lot of data that is lacking. When you look at the randomized control trials about quality and telemedicine, almost all of those trials have shown that you get equal for various conditions, but there aren't really specific telemedicine studies that have been done in vascular surgery. And we need data that looks at what it would be to use a surrogate for physical exam. So we also need data that shows that even when a physical exam is not needed, that is still a quality visit and what that would encounter, what that would entail. Many people, as I was saying before, think about, well, if you can't do a physical exam, then that's not a quality visit, but there are surrogates. Can we use imaging as a surrogate for quality and for the physical exam? Earlier in the discussion we were having, we were talking about how patients that are coming in for surveillance, and Dr. Lynn, you've published on this, how patients that are coming in for surveillance can actually be seen through a telemedicine visit, and they appreciate that simplification of not having to travel for the in-person visit in addition to their surveillance if it's done at a different time. And then we need information about access. Who is accessing telemedicine visits when they're offered? Showing that 
actually CMS beneficiaries and older patients can use telemedicine. The cost considerations are something that I found interesting, and some of these actually come from Democrats. There is this discussion about additive versus substantive encounters. An additive encounter is having a new encounter that you would not have had. So the patient is being something for the, that they wouldn't have been seen for before. And CMS is now required to pay for that if we're requiring payer parity versus substantive. We're substituting a visit for their surveillance study versus adding on a new visit. Legislatures are pleased and happy to pay for substantive visits, but they are concerned about having additive visits where you now have providers that are sitting in the comfort of their home providing care for something that the patient wouldn't have been seen for before. That is why there is a push to potentially lower reimbursement for telemedicine. In my clinic, when I see somebody through telemedicine, I still have our MA that connects with them before me and maybe talks to them about their medications. If it generates an, a, a procedure, if they're gonna have surgery, my surgery scheduler still has to call and talk to that patient as well as my nurse has to still call and talk to that. What legislators, legislators need to realize is that even though the visit occurred with the patient at home, the team that is required to carry out patient care is still all active whenever we're doing telemedicine visits. And then downstream care. Is there a way for us to avoid emergency room visits or hospital admissions because we are using telemedicine rather than using in-person visits or making them come in because there was no way to see them? And there isn't a lot of data in that area. I wanna stop because we're gonna have a, a discussion about the patient as the center of telemedicine with our next speaker. And I want you to think about some of these things so that we can answer these questions after that talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys. That was a great update, um, as well as sort of looking at the value in um, many different lenses and different perspectives. And I really, um, I think that is, um, you know, as they say, uh, price is what you pay, value is what you get. So you really want to get that value and not pay the high price because that's really the um, um, the goals of uh, the triple the triple aim or quadruple aim of healthcare. So, so uh, please continue to ask questions. But for now, we will turn on to our next uh, speaker. Um, and Dr. Nikum, who will give us a hands-on experience for the use of Mundi, a digital app for virtual care, and um, looking forward to it. Sure. Thank you, Judith. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I think I unmuted myself. Uh, and I must thank SVS, the Health IT Task Force, uh, for the opportunity to present a totally different concept than what we spoke about, but essentially ingredient of where the healthcare is going surgical practice and patient outcomes are going, especially led by technology. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Hodgson and Dr. Lin, and again, uh, to Misty Humphreys for the segue into this topic. Uh, we all saw how, how healthcare is in silos today. So essentially, we think the solution is gonna come from a system that works beyond the silos because the silos themselves have no reason to cooperate with each other but regulatory efforts, patient expectations, the technological push in lives of people, which is making them at the center of everything otherwise, is likely to force these kind of ecosystems of which telemedicine is just one part of these ecosystems. And that's what we'll talk about. Uh, we did send out a document and I know some of you did go on and create uh, their logins into the system to experience some of the hands-on experience from earlier. And for those who did not, uh, we will be offering the same document afterwards on SVS Connect, or I'll leave you some, with some resources that you can get in touch with in case you need more information. But the point of this hands-on presentation is for everybody to get the ability to connect through a secure system and understand how these uh, ecosystems are likely to work in the future, bringing patients and doctors closer together than before less dependent on hospital systems and working towards uh, the ultimate patient care goals of quality and safety. 
Uh, I have been a vascular surgeon in Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania for over 13 years now. Uh, about five years ago, uh, I started, I'm the founder and CEO of Mundai.com, which works through New York City as well as Pennsylvania. And we'll talk about some of the components of this ecosystem. Uh, we did float these four steps as if when you want to do, when you want to get a hands-on experience, it's easiest if you are in the system. So for those who are already logged in, they may be able to follow along, but for those who have not yet logged in, it may be easier to follow through this uh, presentation. Just listen to all the components that are available to you, and then at your own pace, uh, log into the system using the document that we will be providing on SVS Connect. But when you log in, you can create a profile section that's going to help you connect with each other. Connect with your colleagues, so whether that means uh, SVS members or whether you're referring doctors, uh, your uh, your mid-level providers, your nurses, and of course, connect with the demo patient because that will give you a real hands-on in terms of uh, seeing the patient-sided interactions. As an ecosystem, it has four essential components of which in the pandemic period, certainly telemedicine has come out as big, but this offers the ability to in connect with anybody in your network and do virtual visits, whether it's with patients or providers or your own team, and we'll talk about it. Certainly there's text messaging component to it. Uh, there is a patient image and record viewing uh, component that you can see patients images and records from practically any hospital across the US. And there is um, the social, uh, social media integration and branding part, patient education part that I'll talk to a little bit. But all these put together with some additional elements make it into an ecosystem. And we think these kind of ecosystems are more likely to be prevalent as years go by. You'll hear more of interoperability, interconnectivity, patient-centeredness as the principles by which these will be unleashed uh, in the entire gap that exists between the silos across the nation. Uh, of course, when you log in, you have the option of using the iOS app or the Android app, or you could log into the from the computer, desktop, laptop, or your cell phone, and you could use it interchangeably. We see that patients prefer smartphones. Physicians, depending on their location, sometimes do video conferencing more through uh, the desktop or laptop and uh, use on-the-go uh, app or uh, the website to the mobile when they're doing some other functions or, or they're outside the hospital system. Certainly keeping the app with notification on is very helpful because you get the notifications from your colleagues or patients presenting in your virtual waiting room. At the core, it is essentially uh, a network, a communication network in a secure HIPAA compliant manner that you get to create for yourself. What it means is you could connect with other SVS members, but you could also connect with your referring doctor, a primary care physician in your neighborhood or somewhere else, or a cardiologist you want to send patients a referral to. And you are able to create your own HIPAA compliant network, not just of physicians, uh, but mid-level providers, uh, nurse assistants, nurses, and of course with patients. So you get to create your own secure network and it is agnostic to hospital organizations. So you can have this network span across hospitals in different parts of the country. And on that network is the entire functionality that I will talk about. But you are the king and you get to decide what kind of network you want to create in a secure manner. You can exchange text messages, video chats, and transfer files and images. Uh, this is a slide of the, some of our panel members today who you can actually communicate with directly easily. Uh, and of course, I'll leave the same slide at the end for you to look at it more leisurely. But you see all of them have their own QR codes, and I'll talk about QR codes, but they also have their own web addresses at the bottom. And if you reach out to them, that's a secure network. You can uh, do patient information transfer to them and share images with them, as well as video chat with them instantaneously. And I'll leave this slide at the end once again. Uh, inside, one important element to know is your unique identifier. As soon as you create an account, basically you get a unique identifier, which is on your profile page under the About Me section. And all the description I'm giving you will be in the PDF document that will be on SVS Connect afterwards to make it easy. But this unique identifier is what connects you. So you can connect to people through unique identifiers and your own unique identifier is in the About Me section on your profile page. Uh, meet Elizabeth Cooper, your demo patient. Um, obviously, uh, she, she is somebody you can connect with to see all the elements of patient-sided system of it. Uh, you can send messages and uh, 
practically uh, she'll allow you to see entire medical records. That's a unique identifier on the left side. So feel free to connect with Liz Cooper and she will allow you to look at, uh, she'll authorize her medical records to you. In the medical records, please definitely go to the uh, image and report section uh, where there's a section called Diacom images. You'll be able to experience the entire Diacom viewer from your, uh, your app or from the smartphone or computer. Uh, so uh, in the document, it will tell you the unique ID of Elizabeth Cooper, but this is it. This is how you can connect with her. A little bit about these QR codes. You saw those earlier. Many of us already know what QR codes are. Uh, but to tell you briefly, as soon as you log into the system, a unique QR code is created for yourself. It's located on your dashboard and that's yours to keep. That means you can use it to put it on business cards, marketing materials, newspaper advertisements, resumes, or display in visitor areas. Essentially, pointing a cell phone camera at the QR code immediately brings up your profile page to anybody who opens a cell phone and points the camera at the QR code. And that profile page, which is an internet page, also has your first name and last name as part of the address. And that's where your profile uh, is available for anybody to communicate. At the core, of course, there's a text messaging section because text messaging, all of us are used to it where you can attach files and images. But additionally, you will see certain icons like the pink camera that takes you to the audio video conferencing section and the red key area, which is the sign for the patient record. So this communication module is actually at the heart of the entire system between physicians all providers with each other, as well as across to the patients. All of us think telemedicine as the important element, certainly as an ecosystem, telemedicine is an extremely important component of it. So once you establish your own network, you have many ways you can use uh, telemedicine on it, whether it's physician to physician, provider to provider, or provider to patient. If you are connected on the network, all you do is press the AV conference now button and your video conferencing begins. The other common favorite one people use is a one-time link. Uh, it's kind of like, like what you're getting used to on other platforms where you can generate a one-time link for somebody who's not yet connected formally in the Mundai system with you. You send it out to them. As soon as they click on it, they appear on your virtual waiting room. And of course there's a scheduler. So if anybody wants to use the scheduler and you can practice all this yourself, whether you practice on your office staff, your friends, family, or real patients or with the demo patient, as soon as you log in, you have full access to the system. Uh, this is your virtual waiting room. On mobile, it looks like this. On the web, kind of like this, where anybody who shows up in the, to do a video conference with you, no matter which pathway they chose, they are able to appear in your virtual waiting room. And the app gives you a ding-dong bell telling you that somebody just appeared in your virtual waiting room. You could use it from the cell phone at that time, or you could go to your desktop laptop and just click on the join now button and the video conferencing begins. Now that can be used for physician to physician, physician to patient, anybody that you created the network with, you can use. And of course, as I said, up here is the link that you can generate a one-time link. Every time you press on it, you can generate a one-time link that can be sent to somebody who's not yet connected with you each click generates a totally different link. So let's say you have a 20 patient office tomorrow, your office staff who has a proxy access to this account can actually generate all the links, send it to all those patients, and all of them have their own link. As soon as they click, they appear in your virtual waiting room and you can video conference with them depending upon what their schedules are. This uh, orange or red icon with the key is the one where patient records exist. Uh, in this patient record, you will see the reports and imaging and underneath that there's a DICOM imaging section. Uh, it has a full functioning DICOM viewer. So feel free to play around with the demo patient's account so you can see the DICOM viewer with all the functionality that we used to, including different windows, uh, scrolling through the entire CT scans and MRIs and the 3D uh, reconstructions, everything. The beauty of it is it is available to you to see images and we, uh, of patients from any hospital as long as the patient is authorizing you to do it. And you can see it instantaneously. You know, if you get a call for a ruptured aneurysm from an ER somewhere, that provider or patient can actually connect with you and you can instantaneously see the entire CT scan and say, no, that's just an endo leak. That's not a ruptured aneurysm. You know, stuff like this that we are commonly um, used to. 
Now, in the patient profile, you also see this collaborate button up top. The collaborate button actually allows a primary care doctor to bring you in on a patient record that they may be uh, seeing, or you could bring in another specialist. So whether it is MISTI looking at the thoracic outlet syndrome, CAT scan, or MRI that you have, you can essentially share it with other providers uh, in the interest of patient care. Feel free to try this feature out on the demo patient as well. And this is another very important element, your personal profile page. So all of all providers have their own personal profile page where their professional information resides. So whether it's your CV, whether it's your procedure expertise, your license registration information, or your specialties are displayed there. But more importantly, you can populate it with photographs, whether they're clinical photograph, non-clinical photograph, uh, whatever you want patients and other providers to see what goes here, whether it is about your research, whether it is about procedures you do, you can add captions to each photograph. So when you click on it, there's a lot of information that you can put in for patient education, for patient handout materials. Easily you can add these videos. Now these are can be embedded from YouTube or Vimeo videos, which means you just click a share link from those videos and paste it here. And the videos automatically appear. Some of the panelists who have their profiles have some of the videos on their profiles and you should be able to see those immediately. So if you are using this, you embed a video, whether you created it or whether you took something from the internet that was uh, something you wanted patients to know, you embed here and it shows up on your profile. You can add captions, you can add some educational material to it and patients get to see it immediately. This kind of serves as a digital CV as well and people use it for uh, multiple purposes. You can use your profile to integrate on social media. On the right side, you're going to see social media sharing icons. So your own profile, either you yourself, your contacts, patients can share it on social media. So they can refer uh, to their family and friends saying, hey, this is a good vascular surgeon I came across. This is a profile, I'm gonna share it. You yourself can do it. And there are some more cool stuff. You can actually target it geographically if you really wanted to get into the business side of it. But, so people use it for personal and profile branding. Uh, practice branding, but you can use it very well for patient education, depending upon what videos you put in. You could be having uh, patient testimonials there, procedure videos there. You could be putting in instructions for patient in pre-op care or post-operative follow-up, BQI. Um, any kind of videos can be embedded for patients to see. So that's your social media integration part. And of course, there are many more elements, creating proxies, asking somebody else to do the work when you're not on call. There are many functional elements and workflow elements that are built into the system. Anytime you have a question, feel free to send it out here. And if anybody wants one-on-one uh, -on -one instructions, we can arrange that. My team can definitely help practices uh, get this, but the hands-on element is going to give you a lot of leverage and pretty much doing things yourself, just like the Apple's principle, make it so easy that anybody can use it for themselves and don't really need uh, a formal training. And this is the slide I'm going to leave everybody with. But once again, I want to thank Judith, uh, SVS Health IT Task Force, Dr. Hudson, uh, for the opportunity to get this some, into the hands of vascular surgeons who can interconnect with each other and use it to their best abilities because we think this is where the future lies. Thank you. Great, Chip. That was, thank you so much. That was fantastic for your demonstration of this HIPAA compliant digital app to enhance both patient engagement and the interoperability across healthcare systems. Yeah, we, we discussed this current silos of the various EMR and the health system. So this app really will promote some of that um, digital integration and give patient back the control, the autonomy to take charge of their own records. So before we continue um, with our um, discussion, we have a couple of questions so I wanna bring up, uh, can you bring up the questions from our audience so we can answer them and then we'll have the panelists also discuss. So from Dr. Joseph Catronio, who contacts the patient to enroll them? Good question. In the system, um, uh, Dr. Contreno, the uh, system is something that you can enroll your existing patients but they themselves have their side. We talked about the physician side of it. If you go to mundai.com as a website, you're gonna see it's totally patient-centered, which means in the community, they can be seeing your profile and reaching out to you. 
but you can provide uh, the contact to the patient. Your office can help them enroll, but they need to be physically connected with you at some point for their medical records to be used by you. Uh, and that's a one-time connection that they make with you. Great. So our next uh, question is from Dr. Anil Hingarani. So many of my older patients have problems setting up telemedicine visits. So how do we get this uh, streamlined? That's a problem in most of our clinics, yeah. So I don't know if Misty wants to answer it because she has tremendous experience in population-based look at telemedicine. I can tell you from technical standpoint, we are already in this curve that last time I talked about US is in a, uh, in a chasm between early adapters and uh, innovators. And that chasm is being crossed because we're pretty much forcing telemedicine on the community at this point. And uh, the pandemic has made it easy for everybody to swallow the pill and do what needs to be done, whether it means go to the Chrome browser or do this, point the camera here and there. People are putting themselves through the learning process. Uh, I, we do think that the technology is going to make it easy and almost everybody's falling through the training process because it's a requirement. And, and what we find is there's always a technology expert in every family who plays that role. So it's not the 70 year old patient with a smartphone in their hand, you'll find their son or daughter or daughter-in-law who's helping them through the process. So uh, don't have a real solution. I don't know if Misty has a comment on that. Well, I was gonna say, Anil has a good point here, but I do see this app as something that's a little bit different in some ways. I see this app and we've talked about this as being a real empowerment for patients because patients in some places get very fragmented care. They see one provider at one hospital, they see another provider at another. And this allows them to have access to their imaging. It allows them to have access to their notes that the providers have written. It is in extremely frustrating for me to see a consult from a patient where they have CT scans for five different locations and I'm trying to get all of those things brought to me so that I can evaluate the patient plus get the reports for MRIs that were done in different places. And this really allows patients to do this. So right now it may not be something that every single patient is gonna sign on for because we have certain methods for using telemedicine but I see this as something that is a start for patients who are really taking their own medical care into their own hands and kind of bypassing some of the clunkiness that we have within our own health system. We talked earlier about how the EMRs are gonna to talk to each other. Even with our EMRs talking to each other, I can't see images. And we have patients that we frequently get sent to us from another hospital that we share an EMR with. And they say, well, you know, isn't the, aren't the, images in there. Can't you see the CT scan? No, I can't. I can see the report, but I'm not going to plan your EVAR based on the radiology report. I'm going to plan it based on me seeing the images. And so there are still a lot of limitations with, with where we are. That's, that's great points. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's really, um, and I think physician, uh, patients now doctor shop. They go to, uh, usually I'm their second or third opinion. They come with all these records. And you have to sort through all of them. So it's nice to have it, even if they're in the same, um, you know, health system, sometimes you can't get all those records. So, yeah. So this is actually a great, um, great portal and to really give patients the autonomy to bring that. Um, Anil also has another question. This is not part of uh, SBS. It, it is a private company so far. Um, yeah, and Anil, that's a great question because this came out of my desire to basically be on a, uh, not be regulated by government side and not be held hostage by any hospital system or EMR system, but unleash a patient and what we call as free market forces, stuff that will come that has to happen in a nation like United States. So it came out of a passion to create patient-centered medicine. Uh, certainly we had to build in all the workflows for physicians who are the caretakers and kind of leverage the relationship between patients and physicians. But as of now, it's a private company. Uh, and that's why the conflict slide was there. This is Oliver. Um, I have a question for Missy. You brought some a really interesting slide about the incentives uh, for, or what government would encourage or discourage with, uh, with regard to telemedicine use. 
do you, what are your thoughts or what are they, it seems like the, you know, fee for service is one thing, you know, but versus, you know, like a Medicare Advantage program or plan where, you know, maybe um, these sorts of services would be used more frequently, right? Where you're encouraged to keep patients healthy, keep them out of the hospital. Any thoughts there? So I've actually done a couple of webinars for some national um, telemedicine programs, and there are companies that are doing that. So a lot of these companies who have primary care um, uh, models, what they do is they've purchased a lot of laptops. They have people that take, or not laptops, tablets. They have people that take the Mm -hmm. tablet to the patient's house. That's their sole job is they drive around all day taking the tablet to the patient's home so that the provider can do telemedicine. They don't do it for all of them, but it, especially in COVID, they really ramped this up. And that's how they're bringing technology to places. I thought it was incredibly interesting. And in some ways, that is exactly what they see it as. We can decrease costs by not having a physical establishment or not having as many physical establishments. And it is cheaper for us to pay for somebody to drive a tablet around to different places than it is to really kind of invest in some of the infrastructure that comes with brick and mortar. So I think it's only going to, especially for um, some of your uh, primary care networks, they're going to start kind of doing this. And that's why I think everybody has to be well versed in it and be offering it because we're going to be shut out if we're not. And some people are envisioning the concept of virtual hospitals, certainly not for vascular surgery, but just the thought process that you can think of a hospital as a virtual element is a big deal. That means people are thinking along. So the process has started. We will see how it evolves. And it's all about creating a patient-centered approach because that's where we should land. I mean, if it's our family member, that's what we want happening. And I think right now where we are in this group and, and you know, amongst the, the people that are watching this, we're really trying to think outside of the box. We're trying mm-hmm. to plan, you know, step five or six down the road because these are things that are coming. And I love that we're, we're out in front of it. And recognize in that regard that when the SVS called for volunteers to put this task force together, we obviously got people that have some personal conflicts because these are the people that are knowledgeable in this area. But we manage those conflicts, we get them going, and, and uh, you can see what's happened here. Well, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Lynn on putting together an outstanding panel. I'm not the least bit surprised. She always comes through for us, and as have all of our other panelists, it's been a great discussion. Uh, Dr. Lynn, did you have any final closing comments? Um, yes, um, Dr. Hodgson, this is great. During the last two hours, we learned about some really cool initiatives from the SVS Health Information Technology Task Force. It's been both an honor and privilege to be part of this uh, great task force. And I truly enjoyed our open discussion on how to take better care of our patients via various digital platforms. So please look for updates at the SVS Vascular Surgery website and as well as for the uh, SVS uh, set for more updated information regarding our additional digital health initiatives. And our next step will be to continue our innovation in vascular care using digital technology and vascular surgery. So be well, stay safe, and go digital. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, buddy. All right. Good night. Thank you.